Good evening and welcome to ABTN National News Weekend. I'm Daryl Stranger. Roseanne Archibald has made history, becoming the first woman to ever be elected National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations. Archibald won after Reginald Belrose conceded following five rounds of ballots over two days. After the five rounds, she increased her lead and received 205 votes for 50.5% of the votes cast. Reginald Belrose received 144 votes for 35.5% of the votes. Jody Wilson-Raybould is calling it quits. After six years as their Member of Parliament, Wilson-Raybould told her constituents in a four-page letter she will not run in the next election, widely expected this fall. The former Liberal Cabinet Minister said Parliament has become more toxic and ineffective and marginalizes people from certain backgrounds. Wilson-Raybould called federal politics a disgraceful triumph of harmful partisanship over substantive action. Prime Minister Trudeau appointed her Canada's first Indigenous Justice Minister in 2015. But she was booted from the Liberal caucus during the SNC-Lavalin scandal four years later. She successfully ran as an independent candidate in 2019. Wilson-Raybould said that she will reveal more details about her future plans at a later date. And in Ottawa, NDP MPs Charlie Angus and Mumila Kakok want Justice Minister David Lametti to appoint a special independent prosecutor to investigate what they say are crimes against children at residential schools. Kakok and Angus held up pictures of two priests accused of abusing children at residential schools. One of them has since passed away, but Kakok says the government has done little to extradite Johannes Revoir, who she says is now living in luxury in France. Both say the discovery of unmarked graves at former residential schools is genocide and a crime against humanity that also needs to be investigated by a private prosecutor. Enough is enough. Indigenous people need truth and justice. Not only about individual abusers like Revoir, but about the hellhole of all genocidal residential school systems that the churches and the federal institution used in their attempts to destroy us and take our lands. But in order to get federal government to justice from the federal government, they must end their long-standing collusion with the Catholic Church. Kawasi's First Nation Chief Cadmus Delorme was joined by the Prime Minister and the Premier of S Saskatchewan to make the Mia Pimatasawin Act official. APTN's Priscilla Wolf brings us details. Together with Kawasas First Nation and Saskatchewan, the Government of Canada is signing the first ever coordination agreement under the Act. The Prime Minister came to Saskatchewan to officially transfer jurisdiction over child welfare to Kawasas First Nation. As part of the Mia and Pima Tisawin Act, Chief Cadmus Delorme says this agreement has been in the works for years. It's a way to keep children connected to their community. Today is a historical day because we never gave up our sovereignty to our children. And today, with the Prime Minister of Canada and the Premier of Saskatchewan, we are going to sign a coordination agreement. And what that means is Prime Minister Trudeau stands beside houses and invests in us. The Prime Minister says since the passing of Bill C-92 in June 2019, they have been working with Cowessis. Never again should kids be taken from their homes, families and communities. The act we passed in June 2019 makes sure of that. To support this agreement, we're investing $38.7 million for the implementation of the CowSS First Nations Child and Family Services. Over the next two years, the funding will help implement the Mia P. Matisowin Act, which will give control of child welfare to the nation and found the Chief Red Bear Lodge. That organization will advocate, develop, and deliver services. Chief DeLorme adds it's his goal to have no more children in care. Every day we will roll up our sleeves to make sure that every child, when we call them home, that they know where home is, and that is Cowes' First Nation, and that they will, will 
dance, they will get their education, and they will walk with their chin up and be a proud Cowes' citizen. The Prime Minister says the Government of Canada is working with other First Nations across the country to sign similar agreements. Priscilla Wolf, APT National News, Saskatoon. Across the country, there's been calls for accountability and support in searching for unmarked graves of children who died at residential schools. Charlotte Moore Jacobs takes us to Fort Providence, a Dene Metis community in the Northwest Territories who led searches 30 years ago. Here's that story. Pascalina Nadley recognizes the family names. My cousin, her husband's last name, my auntie, my mom sister. In the 1990s, Dene and Métis community members in Jatikwe, Fort Providence, led a search around the former Sacred Heart Residential School. Ground penetrating equipment confirmed what elders had been saying for decades. This monument is one of the only few in the country to honor unmarked graves. A tribute to roughly 300 people who were buried here. 161 of those were Indigenous children who were forced to attend Sacred Heart School, stolen from families up and down the Mackenzie River. All the names on there were re related. It brings me to tears to know that relatives will never see them again. The cemetery was used for burials between 1868 and 1929. But in the 1940s, the Roman Catholic Church plowed over it to use it for a potato field. But not before moving the remains of eight missionaries to be reburied in the community's current cemetery. The monument over there also has relatives of mine, their gargans and that. Sam Gargan is a residential school survivor who attended here. The gargan that passed on was two months old. The former Sacred Heart Residential School operated for nearly a hundred years. You know, the road that, that goes along the bank there, we're driving over Bugriza. It wasn't like a, like plots of, uh, of some Bugriza, you know. So a lot would have been maybe during the flu epidemic and, uh, and a lot would have been been because of abuse. Gargan says little documentation means the number of dead is likely much higher. There's no landmark in some areas, not even grave sites were, were marked. So I think they have to be open, be open and honest about it, and then be, be able to, to say, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, um, yeah, we admit that, you know, there were a lot of suspicious death, death that we did investigate, and, and we apologize for it. Bishop John Hansen of the Mackenzie Fort Smith Diocese says local records are limited. You know, there's a lot of talk about records. Um, we don't have a lot of residential school records here, if any. Uh, they were removed at the time that the operates left uh, the residential schools and um, any records that we do have have been forwarded to the TRC. For Natalie, she's been waiting to see her mother Georgina Josephine's records. It still hurts to not know what my mom went through. And she'll continue to visit here in memory of her mother. Charlotte Mort Jacobs, APTN National News, Fort Providence. In Prince Rupert, British Columbia, hundreds marched to honor residential school survivors. The July 1st afternoon was filled with powerful songs and dance performances. APTN's Lee Wilson reports. A sea of orange was outside the courthouse in Prince Rupert. A powerful display of drumming, singing, with many holding up signs to honor residential school survivors. Northwest dance group leaders, carvers, and medicine workers arranged the event. Leanna Spence, Alaska Willam's artist, was one of the organizers. She said the day was meant to help the community heal. So this, this day is about mourning 
all the mass graves that they're finding every day and honoring and thanking our survivors that made it possible for people like me to be here and everybody else. Gwisa Whale is a house leader of the Simchian Nation. He shared that since the unmarked grave discoveries became public, his community has been hurting. You know, when you hear words like, uh, get over it, well, how do you get over something like that? People ripping your children from you and stealing them and then not only stealing that, but stealing your land at the same time and taking your identity to what we are now. So yeah, it's, it's pretty hurtful what, what has happened. A local motorbike club, dance groups, and elders led the way as Indigenous and non-Indigenous marched through Prince Rupert. Singing really brought so much healing, but for us, like coming out of COVID and being, you know, on lockdown for pretty much almost like over a year, we needed this. We needed, we needed our drums, we needed our rattles and our, our medicine and our song and our dance. We need our culture because that's the only way out of, out of healing. Outside the courthouse, a memorial display with children's shoes, toys, and orange flowers. Police cars block traffic for the group to walk to the waterfront. The message was reconciliation and the need for more action from the government in Canada and religious leaders. Yeah, I think the government should uh, step up to the plate. I think the Pope should step up to the plate and uh, release the records that need to be released so that people can put it to rest. Like to hide it under certain places. I mean, what is that saying? You know, come clean. Organizers say they are working towards making Canada Day in Prince Rupert an annual cultural event where people can gather to celebrate. Um, if people could travel here for the All Native Basketball Tournament and spend thousands of dollars on watching these young men play basketball, imagine how much people would travel here for dance, like mask dancers and, and drummers and singers of all ages. This could be something for everybody. Lee Wilson, AP National News, Prince Rupert. Powerful story from Lee there. We have to take a short break, but still to come, two statues brought down by protests in Manitoba on Canada Day are going back up. Why the Indigenous community is upset. Welcome back. Two, two fires that were recently set in Alberta churches have been condemned by the Alberta Premier and the Mayor of Calgary. Now the Alberta AFN Regional Chief says she understands why churches might be targets, but the arson must stop. APTN's Chris Stewart has more. Last week, a fire destroyed a 100-year-old church in Warrenville, just northwest of Edmonton. The St. Baptiste Catholic Church was built in 1907. Investigators say arson is suspected. Alberta Premier Jason Kenney visited the site and had strong words for whoever burned the church to the ground. Hate inspired violence, burning down faith communities, targeting them with this, these acts of violence and intimidation is not reconciliation. It's not the way forward. On Sunday evening, the House of Prayer in Calgary was set on fire, according to Calgary Police. The church has no connection to the Catholic Church. The church was damaged, but not destroyed. Calgary Mayor Nahid Nenshi says these burnings are hurting reconciliation. When you deface or vandalize churches or monuments, you actually are hardening people's hearts at a moment where we need to soften people's hearts, at a moment where people now finally have reconciliation in their heart. I don't want to lose this moment. Alberta AFN Regional Chief Marlene Poitra says there is no proof these fires are connected to the discoveries of unmarked graves at residential schools. But she understands why there is anger. If it is a retaliation against the church and, and you know, the Pope needs to, to pay attention to that and, and make a statement, you know, um, if it is, if it is um, um, our people that is doing it, like they're, they're tired of the injustices that they've had to experience and, and nobody is doing, has done anything about it for the past hundred years and, and we need action. Action, including an apology and compensation to the families of victims. Poitra is urging whoever is setting these fires to stop. A lot of our people go to those churches and, uh, you know, 
especially now at this time, prayer is very important in, in our healing. And, um, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, th this is occurring. And, uh, you know, I, I really hope that whoever is doing it would, would, you know, give it a second thought and, and really think about uh, the, the full impacts of uh, uh, burning those churches. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Two statues brought down by protests in Manitoba on Canada Day will go back up. Premier Brian Pallister made the announcement earlier this week, drawing fire from the Indigenous community. Michelle Karlenzig has more. Protests took down two Queen statues at the Manitoba Legislative on Canada Day, and Queen Victoria lost her head. In the aftermath, nine Conservative MPs wrote this letter to Premier Brian Pallister, calling on him to restore the statues and expressing shock and dismay at what they call vandalism. This morning, Pallister answered those calls. That, uh, tearing down is a lot simpler than building up. But building up is what we have to dedicate ourselves to. He addressed the Canada Day protests by evoking Canada's settler history. The people who came here to this country uh, before it was a country and since didn't come here to destroy anything. They came here to build. Vivian Ketchum, a residential school survivor, says Pallister is missing the point. He has more emotions for a piece of rock than what our emotions and grievances that we're feeling at this time. Ketchum says Pallister has mostly been absent from Indigenous ceremonies and marches. Any of the events that we hold at the legislative building grounds, we never see him coming down to talk to us. So his words of um, reconciliation that he's talking about lately, I'm sorry to say you're going to bleep me out. It's bullshit. Pallister promised to engage with the Indigenous community about wording on the rebuilt statues. But that consultation will not include anyone who brought the statues down. Michelle Karlenzig, APTN National News, Winnipeg. We have to take one final break, but stay with us. We'll bring you the story of a six-year-old who walked almost 200 kilometers for residential school survivors. Welcome back. The Montreal Canadiens are a huge passion for many Indigenous people in Quebec. But when Steve Bonspiel and Ottawa Jacobs got tickets to attend Game 4 of the Stanley Cup Final, they decided to do more than just cheer for their favourite team. They took the opportunity to make a statement. A story by Shushan Bacon, read by Tom Fenario. Steve Bonspiel and his wife Anawa are huge Montreal Canadiens fans. But while they were attending Game 4 of the Stanley Cup Final to cheer on their favorite team, they remained silent and sat for the national anthem. Dude, we need to talk about what is wrong in this country, what can be fixed, respect for Indigenous peoples. Following the discovery of hundreds of unmarked graves across the country near residential schools, the Mohawk couple hopes their action will advance the ongoing conversation of how Indigenous people are treated in Canada. Bonspiel is the editor-publisher of the award-winning Ganawage newspaper, The Eastern Door. As a journalist, he is pleased with how mainstream media is reacting to its protest. On Sportsnet and all of a sudden all these media were interested, which I think is amazing because if this was 20 years ago, they wouldn't care. <laughs> you know, they'd say, who cares? Some, some dumb Indian sitting for, a, you know, a, an anthem, who cares? But now people want to have that conversation more because... They understand more. During their protest, they brandished an eagle feather. It was lent to them by a friend who was a residential school survivor. So I felt that I was carrying him with me, but I was also carrying residential sur school survivors and people who never came home. And from the reaction we got uh, when we posted the Facebook Live and you know we, we posted a photo before, I think people really were more touched this time around. <laughs> Bonspiel adds that not all of the reactions on social media were positive. Nonetheless, he is happy that he used this platform to show his resistance to colonization and to show solidarity to residential school survivors in front of his favorite team. A story by Shoshan Bacon, ABTN National News, Wendage, Quebec. A 12-year-old Mi'kmaq youth ended his six-day walk, traveling almost 200 kilometers. 
His goal was to educate about residential schools and survivors. As Angel Moore reports, it also turned into a journey of healing. Landon Tony breaks through the finish line in his community of Annapolis Valley First Nation, ending his journey of awareness. Uh, yes, very worth it. The walk, everything, just the reaction of the people when I got here, it was awesome. A hero's welcome for a 12-year-old who ended his six-day walk. Chief Gerald Tony hosted the event. Hey, our future leader here. Leaders and community members greeted Landon. Lorraine Whitman says the youth will help us heal. Our youth are so important. We need to listen to them. And this little warrior is exactly showing what we need to do as a whole country. Landon's walk started in his hometown, Bible Hill, Nova Scotia, almost 200 kilometers over six days. Landon's mom, Marsha McLennan, walked with him during that time and says people are starting to heal. People are questioning and people are looking up residential schools and people are talking to their kids and and I think Landon accomplished what he what he wanted and, he, and Landon's great grandmother was a survivor. The walk started near the site of the former Shubenacadie Residential School, where a search is currently underway for unmarked graves. When I heard about all of the numbers going up for all of the graves that they found for all of the residential schools. That just made me mad, so I wanted to show my anger by doing the walk. Supporters joined along the way. The last day, about 100 people walked in the soaring heat, taking breaks to cool off. Nan Smith, a retired teacher, brought snacks for Landon. Usually the teachers are adults, and this time Landon is the teacher, and he's reaching out to all kinds of children. Who He's going to be a role model. He's going to be talked about for a long time. Even Prime Minister Justin Trudeau offered support, tweeting, Know that you're making a difference, and people across the country are with you every step of the way. Landon says this is just the beginning. I'm going to be doing a bigger walk every single year on Canada Day. Sooner I'm going to work my way up to cross a can over Canada. A GoFundMe page has raised over $36,000. A committee of six people will determine where help is needed most. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Annapolis Valley, First Nation. A great story there by Angel. That's all we have for you on this edition of APTN National News Weekend. We leave you with the sights and sounds of a powwow put on by Pegwas First Nation here in Manitoba. I'm Daryl Stranger. Have yourselves a great weekend.